Okay, I consent to this recording. Okay, welcome everybody. So um, I'm happy to introduce uh, our speaker of today, which is uh, Andrei Katsilapa. I don't know if I pronounce <laughs> properly. No, back to the most, so good. Uh, um, he's, uh, he works at the University of Ostrava and he will talk about, uh, I guess, like granular, granular systems. So please, uh, Andre, if, uh, go ahead. All right. So thank you. Thank you for interaction. Thank you for allowing me to, you know, to give this presentation. So uh, first, before I start with physics, uh, I, I just want to tell, uh, tell a little bit, wait, first about co collaboration and then about uh, the university. So uh, this is basically, um, mm, well, the result that I'm presenting today is um, basically a, an accident or, or a happy accident uh, in, in, in modeling, because what we were doing is we were doing some routine work for experimental group in Prague in the Institute of Plasma Physics. Uh, but then by doing this job, we actually found a way to, to kind of get from experiment more than it was done before. So this is what I'll be talking about. Um, so Ostrava, it's, uh, so this is, uh, oh, I should have changed it with, Ros with Wrocław, but uh, well, if you look, uh, Rybnik um, Tych Katowice are, are supposed to be here. So basically, Ostrava is just on the border with with Poland. It's a it's a third largest city in Czech Republic, around three hundred fifty thousand people living there. But it's uh, uh, of uh, the same area size as Wrocław. So basically, it's uh, it's uh, just just uh, huge areas of uh, roads and small houses. So it's, a, so it's a pretty large city if you if you take into account the area, but it's also small if you take into account the inhabitants. Anyway, um, 10 years ago, um, they created uh, the Czech National Supercomputing Center in Ostrava, uh, which is um, attached to the uh, Wysoka Szkola Bańska the, the Technical University of Ostrava. This is a high, this is the, the, the Academy of Mining. I mean, ba, ba, Bańska means, means ma, mining in, in Old Czech. Uh, anyway, it's a, it's a relatively new institution, uh, the BSB, the Technical University of Ostrava. As I said, IT for Innovation, the National Supercomputing Center has uh, 10 years. It's the largest uh, computing center in the Czech Republic. Uh, right now, um, the cluster running, which is the fifth cluster owned by the center, uh, is Carolina. Mm, that is ranked 70 uh, on, on the posi position 71 on the in the in the top 500 fastest clusters in the world. But what is nice is actually eighth uh, if you take into account uh, the consumption, like uh, flops per energy per kilowatt. So it's the eighth most uh, economical and uh, green computer in the world. So these are some these are some um, uh, PR pictures that I got from the PR of IT for innovations. So uh, today I will be talking about the little. Uh, the the model of the of the alloys that uh, that, that we are doing uh, why we are doing this uh, how we are doing this uh, and then I'll be talking about the results that we obtained that allows us to find the elastic properties of uh, ultra fine ultra small grains of uh, uh, decomposed alloys so basically from XRD from the X-ray diffraction uh, data, we can actually reproduce um, the elastic properties of the whole composite, uh, but also take into account what are the, uh, well, determine what are the elastic properties of a single grain in such a composite. So the, the reason for the whole, for the whole idea of, of, of creating the super hard alloys is uh, the um, appliance of such a material in the novel 
uh, fusion uh, thermonuclear reactors. So this is uh, schematics of ITER. This is one of the uh, larger tokamaks of the, the, the toroidal, um, well, the, the, the what? Yeah, toroidal trap, right? Ma magnetical trap for the, for the plasma. So basically you have plasma within this, um, this donut here, um, which is contained in the magnetical field. Uh, this plasma radiates, radiates heat, and this heat has to be absorbed and somehow uh, passed on to water, which cools the reactor. And actually from there is this old steam-like engine that, that, that produces electricity. So there is a, a huge, uh, so, so this material, this, this so-called first wall uh, material uh, has to satisfy very strong um, requirements um, to be of a uh, usage in the reactor. So generally speaking right now, uh, most of the small uh, machines use uh, graphite which is really problematic in the sense that the carbon is a relatively light uh, element. And when some atoms, uh, I, well, nucleus or the particles of hydrogen uh, or, or helium are being sprung from the, from the, from the plasma inside the trap, um, the, 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 the graphite tends to uh, produce some small flakes of, of well, basically graphene or, or, or small, small pieces of graphite, which fall into the reactor and disrupt the plasma, um, well, disrupt the plasma, which causes uh, basically shutdown of the whole reactor. So this is a little bit problematic from the engineering point of view. So the idea is, to put something which is which is consistent, which consists of very heavy elements or heavy elements, much heavier than than hydrogen, um, which has a good thermal conductivity, um, and is a relatively hard um, again material. So uh, and also non-magnetic. <laughs> that's, that's another thing. So uh, the, the 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 relatively obvious obvious. The case is to, to use um, tungsten, which is second uh, second hardest uh, element in, in, in nature. Only uranium is a little bit uh, harder, which I will talk why we don't use uranium later. Uh, anyway, the problematic thing with tungsten is the basically explosive um, oxidation of, the, of, 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 of pure tungsten, which uh, when in contact with air, basically decomposes into this, this, this yellow powder within days or hours. Uh, so this is a, obviously a problematic thing. First, it's a powder which will go into the plasma or disrupt the plasma. Uh, second, I mean, it's basically, I mean, we, we have our wall being destroyed within a matter of days. So the idea is to add uh, some elements to this, uh, to tungsten. The element that will oxidize faster, but uh, um, element that the uh, element with the oxide that will not have this foam-like or powder-like structure, so it will create a strong film around the, around the uh, alloy, and then basically um, passivate pa 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 it, so so it will stop. Uh, reacting with the oxygen. And uh, actually it, it, it pretty nicely uh, work with um, chromium. So adding chromium causes the chromium to oxidize much faster than tungsten and, and creates this very nice black uh, film around the alloy. But of course, as, uh, as the problems like to be, um, or like to multiply, um, this alloy uh, decomposes. So it's actually quite rapidly decomposed into uh, two sets of alloys, one which is uh, rich in tungsten and the other one which is rich in chromium, which again is a little bit problematic because the first one will oxidize and the second one actually doesn't have uh, nice properties. It even has some, 
some magnetic properties in very low temperatures, which is not so important right now. So the idea is, again, and this is a, a, a grant that we have uh, together with uh, Monica Vilemova from the Institute of Plasma Physics, to try to add some substances to the, um, to the system to obtain a stable alloy. So basically we add this, this small, small amount of something, of, of some, some element, which should stabilize uh, our system. And uh, I forgot to ask the question, how, how, how much time do I have? <laughs> so it's 45 minutes. 45 yeah, minutes, all right. So yes, I'll, 15 I'll, of questions. All right, so I'll speed it up. <laughs> there is a there is a, a, a whole cluster of elements that we can use. And generally, they will have two problems or advantages with them. One is the price, which here is represented by the color. Basically, the silver white represents a cheaper, a cheap uh, or relatively cheap uh, elements when uh, the the darker the red is uh, the, the mo mo more expensive material and you can see that uranium is actually pretty expensive so if you want to cover a whole area whole whole um, the, the, this first wall of the of the tokamak is actually we are talking about uh, tons of material so what we need is we need something that is not really so much expensive uh, and the other thing is the um, uh, is the byproduct of using an element in the first wall. So the the question is whether by being uh, in contact with a nuclei of, of of hydrogen or helium and being hit by them uh, will not produce some nuclear. Um, well, some, some, some heavier elements, which will in turn um, slowly, but um, still significantly ra radiate. So we will actually from our clean, very nice uh, thermonuclear fusion reactor, we'll get a reactor that actually produces again, nuclear waste, which is problematic to, to store. And thus this is this recycling limit, which means that uh, we will get something using these elements will actually end up producing some waste which is manageable uh, but uh, using these elements actually will produce us, uh, will produce us waste which is absolutely mm, out of the question from the technical point of view from the from the operation of the mm, of such a uh, power plant so uh, quickly our method uh, our method of, of modeling uh, consists of uh, three levels of um, basically uh, applying uh, statistical physics to our uh, ab initio models. So from our initial structure, what we want to have, so which is either something from a database, our guess, or whatever XR, uh, X-ray diffraction spectrum we have, uh, we have to create some neighborhood to check the stability, some neighborhood of structures. So I will talk about it in a moment, uh, which will produce some kind of entropy and some kind of uh, energy um, into our, into our uh, resultant system. And then we perform the ab initio electronic uh, calculations for the, for the equilibrated volume. This will allow us to somehow model uh, thermal expansion of uh, such, a, such a material. Uh, which in turn requires uh, phononic calculations, which also produce some entropy, some uh, energy term and some entropy term to our um, to our system. And uh, generally speaking, what we want to have is we want to check for a convex hull uh, of the Gibbs energy of formation, which I will show in a moment. So, <coughs> for people who do not know. Uh, what uh, energy of formation or enthalpy of formation, which is uh, a term that's being a little bit erroneously used by uh, in material science, um, is uh, a way of uh, finding out which phase of the material which be uh, will be a stable one in uh, given at, at a given temperature or given pressure, or given any condition that that you you want. 
So basically, if you if you look at a, like a simple physical system as a hydrogen molecule is, uh, we, we basically have, um, if you look at the energy, we have the minimum of the, of the energy and we say, all right, so this is the stable phase because it's a minimum of the uh, a global minimum of energy, right? But this is a, a very simple case where we have a finite am amount of atoms and uh, only one type of atoms. It's, it's a relatively one dimensional minimization problem, which is uh, again, I mean, being, it can be even numerically can be done uh, deterministic. The problem is uh, that when we have more elements, this energy uh, curve will, will not look so nicely. So if you look here, so this is uh, uh, sodium chlorine uh, table salt. If we look at the energy, so if we don't have any, any sod sodium in our system, then the energy is that the minimal one. Well, yes, of course, because chlorium has the most uh, electrons, so it has much lower energy of the binding energy. So, so, so of course the system here will have the lowest energy, but it doesn't mean that this is the most stable one because again, the sodium has to go somewhere. So what we do is we compare these energies to the linear uh, to to a linear combination of pure pure sodium and pure chlorium, and we get a, 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 a set of points like this. So we say, all right, so so because this one is the lowest one, right here, <coughs> this one will be the stable the, the most stable one. But we now can do this iteratively by using this point and this point as a point of reference and then find the, the the phases right the ones that might lie here or here or there or there that are more stable than this one even though mm, their energies will differ so they will for example have higher energies or energies of of, of the mm, of formation but it will uh, the conservation of the mass, the conservation of the elements in the system, will uh, fo force them to be more stable. So if you if we look at the full data, this is taken from A flow. This is the numerical library of material science. We actually see that the only uh, stable phase of of um, sodium chlorine is um, our table salt which uh, here has the symmetry, this cubic symmetry. Uh, so we either have pure, pure uh, chlorium, pure um, sodium or our table salt. Now this iterative method can be um, shown a little bit differently if we look, if we look at the points uh, from purely geometrical point of view. So uh, the points that are stable are the points that geometrically speaking lie on the convex hull of a set of the points with negative and enthalpy or energy of formation. So uh, we can exchange our, our problem of finding global minima and then uh, iteratively compare them to one another to a problem purely geometrical and uh, fairly easy to um, calculate to, 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 to solve a problem of finding convex hull of a set of points, which basically numerical libraries do in a second, even for, for thousands, millions of points. So for our system, uh, this enthalpy will be a little bit complicated. Here we just uh, assume Gibbs entropy for each term. <coughs> Sorry. And we add an extra term of uh, entropy, which is corresponding to the fact that we are modeling alloys. So because we, we model alloys, we have the uh, effect of disorder of our system on the uh, energetics of the, uh, of the model. So it means that our, um, our lattice, uh, can be colored in some ways here for tungsten and chromium, right? We can put the atoms somehow on the lattice 
And the way that we put them on the lattice actually also imposes some disorder in the system. And it also has to be taken into account when alloys are um, modeled. Right. Uh, excuse me for a second. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, this also can be seen. Um, the impact of the phononic entropy also can be seen here on the band structure of some phonon system. So this one has some soft modes, but this is some numerical error. So we have a model of pure chromium, of pure, pure tungsten, and some 70 30 tungsten chromium alloy. Uh, which shows us that in low temperatures, the uh, effect of the entropy of phonons will not be significant. But if we increase temperature rapidly, and we are talking about thousands and, and uh, thousands of, of, of Kelvins because we want to work in a nuclear reactor, then the uh, effect of the phononic, um, uh, phononic entropy also is significant and has to be taken into account. This gives us a problematic thing because it means uh, we need to use uh, a DFT method, which is supercell based. And uh, therefore we cannot use, uh, the, for example, CPA, which is a very good method for modeling alloys because we want to get a phononic spectrum. So for this, uh, we use the special quasi-random structures. Here is... Um, <coughs> a general idea behind them. So these are the structures that are supposed to, in the best uh, possible way, uh, describe in a finite system, the complexity and the randomness of an alloy. So we do it by just calculating a certain correlation function, which can correspond to a probability of finding elements of the same type on different lattice sites. Right, so we can we can calculate what is the ideal function. So so the probability of finding the same uh, element on uh, two different randomly selected uh, lattice nodes is basically the sum of square roots of square uh, of sorry of, of squares of the um, composition number if the composition number just is normalized. So the sum is equal to one. So we know what is the ideal correlation function, but we can calculate for our finite system what the correlation function is and compare it, right? And compare it uh, with, our, uh, with our ideal case. So we get this error function. <coughs> and uh, what we can do is we can iteratively just color our, our, our lattice. So here we, here we have some BCC lattice. Right, we have the points, we have the nearest neighbors. We can color a node. This will, this will not change the mm, correlation function or the error function. But if we add next and next and second and third and fourth element, then we basically can calculate this as a number and we can compare it, right? Um, and we can compare it with the numerical results. So uh, in our approach, uh, we find, and we do it for the uh, purely economical and uh, rational reasons of actually having time on the cluster and not uh, having the time of the computational cluster equal to infinity. So we have to somehow conserve the um, resources. We find that there are some systems that reproduce the randomness of the alloy. So this is the correlation function given for each coordination zone for each side of the lattice, which consists here of 54 sides. So here we have the symmetry groups. And uh, what we can see is that we can actually reproduce the alloy pretty well on the cells with, well, some symmetries, which is something that is in uh, counterintuitive. So this allows us to create some scheme of calculating the, this, this SQS, this, this, this special quasi-random functions, uh, sorry, quasi-random structures, and uh, find a set which is as good as the purely random ones, but uh, still consists of symmetries, which allows us to save resources 
uh, on, on the most expensive part of calculations, namely, uh, the, namely the, the photonic part. So this, will, this part I will skip. This is just uh, a part of the, of the Bachelor of Physics of a student. So generally speaking, we, this, this part here, the, the blue part, is the part of the calculations with, with, uh, which is the most expensive one. Because to, to get from frozen ion approximation in the phononic spectra, basically each structure has to be calculated up to uh, three times number of node times, uh, of, the, of the lattice node times. So to save the, to, 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 to decrease this factor by one or two rows of uh, orders of magnitude, uh, will uh, actually speed up the calculations and allows us allow us to to uh, object uh, uh, um, obtain a full picture of such a system. So this is uh, Gibbs free energy of formation uh, given given for temperature starting from zero Kelvin to three thousand Kelvin, and uh, this iso lines here uh, correspond to. Uh, average of the points at the given temperature. So if we look at the zero temperature, or zero K, sorry, temperature of, of absolute zero, we, we see that uh, none of the system is actually stable. So uh, any alloy we, we, we freeze to zero Kelvin will basically essentially mm, dissolve into pure tungsten and pure chromium. But when we increase the temperature, the State the phases from the right, so pure tank, uh, so the uh, tungsten rich, and from the left, so chromium rich, become stable. So these are the red points, uh, and at some temperature, uh, they become uh, all of the K, all of the alloys become stable. Uh, and if we look at the phase diagram, so here we have again the composition. So this is the participation of tungsten in the alloy in atomic percentage and in weight percentages. Uh, our method, here are these full circles, uh, reproduce experiment, which are the, the, the here the, the points with uh, some opacity, sorry. Mm, much better than uh, other calculations done from uh, pure DFT uh, of um, calculations of the electronic structure and then expanding them to uh, to some finite temperature. And uh, now, knowing this, so knowing that uh, to 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 say what is the stable one, what is the stable phase, we not only have to calculate uh, the phase itself, but also its its neighbors. Sorry, uh, its neighbors on this diagram to find out if in this temperature this is stable. What we can do is we can use the experimental results to obtain the best model uh, for uh, for an alloy. So here we have uh, a micros uh, microscopic picture. So this is uh, two micrometers. This is ten micrometers. So these are the grains of, and again I have to think. So. This is tanks and this is chromium. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, I think so. I have to check it. Sorry. Uh, either one is pure tungsten or the other one is pure tungsten. Uh, and we can look at the um, spectra of the XRD spectra. Here's already subtracted the 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 the, the, the signal from the from from glass. And we can reproduce this by creating our small, um, our small, small, finite um, structures, finite supercells, right? So if we look here, so this is the uh, XRD. Sorry, this is actually XRD at um, of the system that already dissolved a little bit into two different alloys. So we have an alloy which is mostly tungsten, alloy which is tungsten, and alloy which is mostly chromium. And if we look at the time scale, they do decompose as, as previously um, as previously say, so, so this is not a stable phase. But 
what we can look at is we can look at the um, elastic properties because this is something that we can fairly measure. And as you can see, so this is the bulk modulus, um, the shear modulus, and we can compare them between different different uh, systems, different elements or different um, here is we have steel, so this is uh, alloy, we have aluminum, and we have some uh, we have rubber and we have diamonds. So we can see that this this alloy, this the the, the product here, is a, a, a very a very um, hard uh, alloy, almost as hard. Well, it's it's it has much higher bulk modulus than steel. Um, and if we look at the at the young uh, young modulus or the Poisson ratio, it's it's also um, exhibits um, properties of 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 an uh, of of a very um, hard material. But this also means that calculating the properties, the elastic properties of the alloys of uh, after the decomposition, right? will be almost impossible because it would mean that we need to have a system which actually measure this on a very small grain, which if we want to, for example, calculate the, um, a, a, an approximation in this very crude method of the Young modulus, we would have to actually uh, introduce some, uh, some strain of the simple or single grain, which is frankly uh, impossible at this level of technological development. But what we can do is we can now, for for our method, we can add a third, uh, a, a third, <laughs> and, and next stage for each stable phase uh, at existing at some temperature, uh, we can calculate the elastic properties. So we can we can introduce some uh, dislocations, right? Some 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 uh, strain in our system. We can calculate the free energy. And from this curve, we can actually get what is the uh, elastic tensor, right? So this is some 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 notation that allows us to, to to actually comprehend the numbers here. And from the tensor, using approx uh, approximation, so this is the elastic tensor, this is compliance tensor. We can calculate the bulk modulus, shear modulus, um, Young modulus, and the Poisson ratio for a system that is reproducing the grain structure of uh, experimental results. So this is the experiment. So these are the uh, tungsten alloy pieces. So these small, small elements here are hafnium oxide, which is um, in the system. So it also is being taken into account. And then after some time, the original grain still exists, but uh, you get these decomposed microstructures of chromium, of uh, chromium rich elements, uh, alloy, which is here in the black on this figure. So you get this, this nice tiger stripe uh, alloys, uh, alloy grains. But using our approach, we can calculate by just averaging the, um, elastic tensors for each grain, each grain size, and each orientation of the crystal axis, because of course this is not given, that they don't have to be aligned, we can calculate what are first the resultant um, properties. So these are the properties calcul uh, measured, and these are the values calculated with the deviation from the value. But from this averaging, right? From this averaging, we by definition have the values and the, the, the elastic properties for each composite uh, in our, sorry, each grain in our composite, right? So from this, we can actually, from, from experimental input, here being the X uh, ray diffraction spectrum, we can reproduce the stable model of the, so the, find the stable phases at some temperature. And then in lower temperatures, this allows us to find the elastic properties of these uh, alloy grains with uh, hopefully a decent, um, well, accuracy. And uh, 
So that will be it. It's a rapid and abrupt end to the talk. Sorry. Okay. Um, thanks a lot. I, I guess uh, uh, we have plenty of time for, for questions. So if uh, the people have a uh, all right. Questions, please. Uh, you have eight minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You so, uh, at the beginning, you, you you got scared with the with yeah, the time. Yeah, so and I, I got scared that I will not <laughs> not not end up in time. Yeah, yeah. Just... So well, um, yeah. I mean, if people have questions, please just like unmute uh, yourself and uh, and ask uh, questions. I will show this because this is the nicest. Um, uh, let me just ask you something. I'm just, like really naive because I didn't get what's so there is like some time scale in this like uh, uh, figures you have actually in that slide like zero hours, fifteen yep. hours. What yep. is this time scale uh, talking about? All right. So this is this. Uh, so uh, experimentally speaking, what we want to have is we want to have either an alloy which is uh, stable at the room temperature or the temperature of, of 700 uh, Celsius, which is more or less the operating temperature of the of a tokamak. Or in less than ideal case, we want uh, a system which decomposes, but decomposes slowly, which means that it will decompose in manner of months and then these, these tiles can be replaced. And therefore, we have to measure, right? From again, the experimentalists have to measure uh, how fast the decomposition um, occurs. So we have some theoretical model in work to predict it. We still don't. We still haven't finished this this um, this model, the model that allows us to uh, obtain some input for the dynamic of the decomposition of the system. Uh, but it also means uh, that the properties of each grain, right, because it decomposes over time, will change, right? So our, uh, even though our alloy in total, right, if we look at the, sorry, experimental results, uh, wait, 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 um, here, right? <clears throat> if we look at the moduli, right, so we have the young modulus, shear modules, bulk modulus Poisson ratio, they don't really change over time, which uh, might have uh, suggest that the alloy is good for uh, our uh, for our alloy, uh, for our wall, right? Because it is hard, but it is hard as a composite. It's small pieces might actually have much uh, lower um, by 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 twenty percent lower. Uh, values of these modules so the elastic properties of small grains will be different and therefore the alloy itself will be susceptible to uh, not only well to the composition that's 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 one issue but the other issue is that if the plasma bursts inside the reactor and we have this wave of heat and pressure that heats our alloy so if it's a composite of different grains with different properties it might lead to much, uh, much quicker fracture of, of such a system. Of, of uh, just basically, it will destroy our wall and therefore make our uh, power plant uh, useless for some time before uh, the engineers are able to replace a tile that has been destroyed. Okay, so here, so the point is that this instability that you have been talking about is not due to like chemical reactions, but it's more just like a, a from just like elastic perturbations. That's what they're- Well, yeah, yeah, Because that was a, another question I wanted to ask is, I mean, why elasticity process. is there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's basically like, a, so if, if you can imagine a, a jelly, right? If you, we put the red jelly in a jar and then you put the yellow jelly on top. So, uh, and leave it overnight in the, some, 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 cold plates, it will, sorry, half of it in a cold place and half of it in a warm place. Then the, the one that was in the cold place will stay more or less the same, but the one that was in the hot place, 
which will have now this 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 small area with with orange yellow right so the yellow will go to red continuously because they would right dissolve in one another so even though it's technically speaking it is a, a solid right it will exchange places so now we have to know what is the dynamic of this uh, this diffusion right what, what is the what is the relation of the diffusion speed and the temperature? And for these systems, counterintuitively, the lower the uh, temperature, the faster the decomposition. Of course, we are talking lower temperatures by low temperatures is 600 uh, degrees, right? Well, almost 1000 Kelvin. It's a low temperature. Mm -hmm. But uh, still, the decomposition the there has a different dynamics than it has in higher temperatures. So it's it's basically the project is to understand why why it works like this because it's it's kind of a, an open topic. Okay, and then the model building is just like purely phenomenological, like based on on the experimental data, or is there is some there, there is some kind of like a theoretical framework to? No, 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 uh, no, no. It's it's it's, it's uh, so. <laughs> I, I see my 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 lengthy introduction was not so uh, understandable, but. <clears throat> the idea is uh, that the only input from experiment is the XRD here. So okay. we reproduce the experimental elastic properties just from the X-ray diffraction spectrum, which allows us now to find such a structure, such a set of structures, which are locally stable at the given ranges of temperature and therefore can be um, moved to a second level, a second tier of calculations of ele electronic correlations, electronic uh, interactions, then the, the, we introduce the dynamic of the system by calculating the, the, the vibrations. Uh, and from this, we obtain the most stable one. And for the stable, most stable ones, we can calculate elastic properties. And these elastic properties correspond to the uh, properties of the material. So basically what I'm saying, we have from a very minimal set of, from the very minimal set of input parameters from experiment, uh, we have a full prediction, uh, well, a, a, a model with a fully functional uh, predictional part, which means that we can just put it into a black box, run it on the cluster, Right, burn millions of of uh, of money uh, of, of monies uh, in um, computational time and get our answer. What type of um, system will have the best, in this case, elastic properties? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um... It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a many level problem. So. Yeah, I see, I see. No, no, I mean, I was wondering because it looks like really a super complicated uh, thing. So I, would, I was wondering, yeah, okay. But uh, as you were saying, it's like a yeah, many uh, levels. Uh, I was trying to put it here, right? So, so each yeah. level here corresponds to one level of calculations, right? So uh, normally, right, if someone says, okay, okay, so I, I, I want to calculate what will... Um, Fermi surface of my system looks like, right? So what I do is just, I, I get the structure, right? From the structure, I just calculate the DFT, equili equilibrate the volume, find the, relax the system. And uh, then I have the Fermi surface, right? Mm -hmm. I want the Fermi surface depending on temperature. Then I do the second level, which is the quasi harmonic approximation, which allows me to calculate how the system changes, right? Uh, so I can, I can get how the Helmholtz energy, right, changes. Uh, so this is volume versus Helmholtz free energy. So I can find the equilibrium volume and the structure at given temperature, right? Okay, so that's the, that's, that's the next level. So then let's say I'm interested in, uh, I don't know, melting temperatures. I want to approximate melting temperature. So I, well, to, to get it, so I, I need elastic properties. So let's say I want to calculate thermal transport, right? So for this, I need a harmonic phonon spectrum. So I have to calculate not only a frozen, a frozen phonon approximation for a single displacement or actually double displacement, <coughs> um, 
but I also have to uh, calculate triple or quadruple displacement, right? So I have a second, uh, sorry, third level or fourth level of the calculation depth. And this has to be done for each uh, higher level um, elements, right? So if, if okay. this uh, level produced me a set of structures, for each of them, I have to calculate the uh, electronic uh, band structure. And then for each of the cases, because I have different volumes, I have to calculate the phononic structure, right? So this is really actually, uh, mm, it's, it's a power function of the computational uh, complexity, right? Okay. So the lower I go, the, 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 the order of magnitude of the, uh, of the computational resources I need increases. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, any other question? Yeah, Andre, in, in your introductory slides, you presented that this is a pretty big collaboration of, of many institutions. What's the main motivation? I, I, I mean, are you in touch with guys from ITER or, or other? Some well, uh, no, I'm in touch with guys you? from Compass. <laughs> from I, I show ITER because uh, United States pays for ITER. And therefore, it ha it uh, it has uh, these nice schemes for free to use that I can use in my, my presentation. Okay. But no, um, there is a, so at sorry, let's go back here. So in uh, Institute of Plasma Physics in the Czech Academy of Science in Prague, they had a small tokamak which was called Compass, which they now sold for well, I know the price. They sold it for one euro. Uh, to a Portuguese institution, but uh, they have to pay for transport, uh, and bought a new one, which is much larger. I think it's, uh, so the old one, wait, I will look for a picture, because I have it somehow, somewhere, because I was there. Uh, wait, let uh, me... Mm. You, you just still see the presentation, right? You don't see my personal photos. Yeah, yeah that's right. You see the presentation. Because <laughs> we need to go to. Uh, he was uh, here. Photos. Um, no. It was it was uh, uh, it's 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 relatively easy to find because it it was uh, I, I remember when I was visiting there the, the first time the the the, the, the center uh, we were talking about this new new disease in China hmm. uh, and whether it will spread to Europe or not. <laughs> so eventually we know the answer. Yes, yes. Well, well, now we do, but then I was not sure. It was... Uh... Yeah, but uh, just, 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 just to... Oh, this is... huh. oh yeah, 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 I found it. So let's just go here and now change that. So stop sharing this and share this here. So this is the so this is the tokamak, uh, the, the the one that is actually already uh, in Portugal. So the new one is much larger. It should fill the whole room. So this is the the power cords used to transport the energy to start plasma and then transport energy out. Uh, when it's being produced, right? So this is the tokamak, and, and uh, this is a, this is the scale, right? Of the Czech tokamak. Uh, the, the, so, so basically, here you could actually look into, like, put your head inside the 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 the, the, um, the chamber of the tokamak. The the new one is supposed to be as large as uh, well, so so big that we are able to crawl into it. Fortunately, haven't managed to to see it yet. Mm, well, just here. 
I'm going back here to the present. Yeah, no, 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 not my calculations here. Right. So this is the Institute of Plasma Physics, uh, but they don't actually measure anything, uh, everything, right? They, they they have some people doing the uh, X-ray diffraction. They have people who center the alloys because I mean, producing alloys from tungsten it's its own art and it's its own science because of this very high melting point for tungsten. So basically, you don't create alloys by melting, you, you do it by sintering. So you put it into a chamber, you have some grinder there, which grinds it into a powder, and then you basically uh, add energy to the system. So basically you, you create this annealing, uh, this, this type of annealing, which actually creates the small grains of, of, of alloy. So they do it in the Institute of Plasma Physics, but uh, for example, elastic properties are, are being measured by the Institute of Thermomechanics. So it's a it's a different it's a different uh, institution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, but but uh, basically, so out of all of these people, uh, I, I was the only theoretical. Uh, oh. oh, okay. Dominic Lego also was the, from, from my team. But the, but the rest of the people are the experimentalists. There's uh, also a problem that, uh, so, so there's the, the, the director of the COMPASS of the whole institute. Well, it's not, he's not director of the Institute of Plasma Physics, he's director of the COMPASS project. So of the Tokamak. Uh, so David, uh, so it's David Sakaya and he's uh, actually, he also has some problem like theoretical problem for people to solve, he tries. To, he tries to sell it to other people. We also we also attempt to to solve it, but it's 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 really 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 problematic thing. So it's basically it's the ratio of the. Uh, they want to know what is the penetration depth of uh, different hydrogen structures inside the given wall. So if you have an atom of, of hydrogen, so, so this is actually a very, very interesting problem. So the problem is that somehow they have more fuel in the reactor that they would that they added. And uh, this fuel comes from previous usages of the reactor. So when the plasma hit the wall, some of the hydrogen got there stuck there. And now it's being because the walls hit is being actually given back to, to plasma and uh, suddenly you have too much fuel in your system. So they need to calculate this ratio. And this is actually problematic from the point of view of the reactor. And so, yeah, so if someone wants to attempt this, so I, I can give you con con contact to, to, to the director. Okay, it seems uh, we don't have more questions. So, let me officially thank you again uh, for, for, for the nice talk. Um, I stopped the recording.